with all the NAR changes, I asked a really good friend of mine to come on who is certified in the buyer representation, like all the new changes. Um, Jason K is in Colorado. He's in Boulder, Colorado. He runs a successful modern team um, in at EXP with how many people underneath you now, Jason? 87. 87 people underneath them growing super fast. Um, he is an engineer by trade. <laughs> He's a hiker. He's a teacher. He has a love for teaching. He just wrote a book. And so, you know, I asked him to come on because he created a CE class for Colorado, but I asked him to give an overview because a lot of us have been in a lot of the classes lately. And I got to tell you, I was in a class yesterday. I think he was an attorney and I was even more confused when I left. Um, and so it's always good to get everybody's different perspective. And then when we're done, you guys, I'm going to send like all the, a, a compilation of all the resources, the best resources. So Jason, I'm going to pass it over to you. But before I do, give us a fun fact. Fun fact. Okay. Um, I've skied with a lot of skiers over the years, and the quadriplegic skiers I've skied with are better than the able-bodied, and that's saying something. Oh, yeah, because they gotta work it all. Okay, <clears throat> I'm, gonna try to, I'm gonna try to ski with some of those people. I love it. They are amazing skiers. Um, I say that because I like to ski the trees and the bumps, and they can go places I literally can't go. I can't get low enough. Okay. They're in a sit ski. God, how is that possible? Okay, well, hopefully I get to ski with you and Trish. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this, All right. Um, winter. So I've taught this class for quite a few years and variations on the theme. This specific class I've taught more than a dozen times. It is a three-hour class. So I'm going to be cutting a lot of stuff out. The class is best interactive. There are three, well, four of you here. So tell me, what do you guys want to get out of this class? What do you want to learn? Feel free to stick it in the chat box, open your mic, shout it out. I mean, there's not many of us here, so we can go nuts. I guess um, to better explain the new th the new way of doing things with buyers. Okay. Um, I think many in our area are still, from my conversations, they're not aware at all of what's going on. So it is our job to explain it, explain it well, and just be patient. But um, it, it would be great to get your pointers on how to approach the buyers and not scare them, not mm -hmm. overwhelm them, but yeah. just give them the plain, simple facts to the to the point. So I appreciate that. Perfect. Thank you Anyone for being else? here, Jason. Absolutely. Anyone else? Go for it, Tanya. You're, You're muted, muted, Tanya. Ah, uh, verbiage. There we go. Yeah, we definitely need some verbiage. Yesterday, um, they were talking about the uh, section where it's, you know, the seller pays or the buyer pays and then where the brokerage pays. And then he was talking about how in section three, if you put section three and not section two, it cancels out section three. Like that was a little confusing right there. And I think that's really important. And then really any verbiage that we you have uh, uh yesterday they also i'll send this to you jason she put everything in a summary for the buyer mm -hmm. like she in the contract she summarized okay. it and it was like oh my god that's that cool so refreshing so i'll send, I love that, that. send you a copy of that i'll actually text it to you because you may be able to refer to it okay i'll text that to you now cool anyone else or i'll get started with those things okay so I'll get started with that. How many of you are in Colorado? One. All right, just to let you know. Uh, there's um, about four people from Colorado coming on too. Okay. So Colorado has its own laws. Some of them contradict NAR settlement, which makes life kind of interesting. The NAR settlement actually contradicts itself, which is where some of the confusion actually comes from. Um, <clears throat> I am not an attorney, nor am I one, uh, nor do I play one on TV. Um, attorneys like to render opinions, which means they contradict each other. And I sat in on two classes, one with our um, 
head of head attorney for CAR, Colorado Area Realtors, and then a attorney who sits on the forms committee. And the two of them vehemently disagreed with each other on how to fill things out. So, and they have since contradicted each other from that meeting a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month now. But you get the idea. This is a fluid situation. Roll with it. I know I talked with my friends in New Jersey. I'm like, okay, so what are you guys doing? They're like, I don't know yet. Like, what do you mean you don't know? It's like, we literally have gotten no direction yet from state, from our brokers. It's like, it's it's a cluster. I'm like, okay. So, you know, all this stuff oh. is- in Jason, who are you talking to in New Jersey? Oh, I'm, I'm from in New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, um, we are. Jeffrey Kist has been amazing. Like a lot of agents yeah. don't show up to our weekly meetings, and that is a huge well, mistake. Well, this was also a month ago that I spoke with oh. them. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, again, if you don't go to your meetings, you're not going to learn stuff. So, highly recommend going to your state meetings. So, where's all this going? Well. <clears throat> Being not an attorney, corporate gave me this to talk about. I'm not an attorney. You're not going to get great stuff from me. Um, treat the class as a syllabus. Um, the other piece with this is <clears throat> know where your wheelhouse is. Go to specific people. Figure out what you need to do. I'm leaning heavily on our brokers to figure out what we need to do because there's conflicting information. Um, one of the things I got from our car representative was go fill out a form that the Bar Association created for us. And our corporate said, no, don't. And this is the main theme here. You want to be open and transparent. You don't want to do anything shady. You want to tell your clients what you're doing. And the big thing with the Bar Association form is this is now a separate agreement that does not have to deal with the buyer or the seller. The DOJ wants the buyer and the seller involved. They want transparency. That's how we got into this whole mess. So if you keep that in the back of your mind, um, am I being transparent? You know, some of these workarounds, I've had two attorneys point blank say, you're opening yourselves up to getting sued by some of the ambulance chasers. Do you really want to do it? Do you want to post anywhere what the commissions are? You could have it as a canned response on your text where you get a text in, what's the commission on 123 Main Street? The commission is seven balloons. Here you go. Have fun. <clears throat> Whatever it is, it is. You tell your clients and then they start negotiating. That's what the DOJ wants. So I already shut off my um, cell phone. The reason why I bring that up is because this is something that I do with my clients when I first meet them. I make a point of it because why do you think I do that? Actually, that's a great question. Let's start with that now. Anyone well, want to give paying attention to the process and only that? Yep. And then, and I'm not going to be distracted because the phone will start going off and I'll ignore it, but they might not. But making it a point that I have now shut off my phone for them, mm -hmm. I'm going to point blank look at them, go, This is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. This is why we're doing it. You are my sole function. You're the main reason why I'm here. I'm paying only attention to you. And during this process, I'm that's everything. <laughs> I'm on my phone because I'm sending you what happened yesterday, so. Okay. So I'm actually going to um, share my screen a little bit because you don't need to look at me. Okay, so here we go. Everyone can see this? All right, cool. So the main point here, <clears throat> is I am from New Jersey, I do talk fast, I do talk in acronym speak, I am a recovering engineer, which means I'm definitely speaking acronyms. If I say something you guys don't understand, stop me, because this is all about you. I mean, I'm, I've got six more of these CE classes I'm teaching. I probably can do it in my sleep without any notes or slides at this point. But the whole point here is, the biggest thing we need to do is, buyers are now like listings. This is no longer something the newbie agents get because, oh, we'll just get paid or whatever. It's like, no, we need to fight for this. We need to show what our value proposition is. <clears throat> so, great. What does that look like and how do we do it? Well, 
I created this cool little icon. I call it the value proposition stool, not very creative. But the whole point is, if you're lacking on one of these three skills, you're going to have a very wobbly proposition. Your buyers are going to feel it. They're going to sense it. They're going to see it. They may hear it. It depends on how they learn and what words they use. Key into those words because that's their learning style. And you want to present the information in their learning style. My wife loves to tell me things. I don't learn by hearing it. I have to see it and I have to write it. So, you know, if she keeps telling me things, like I was trying to learn Italian and she's going over the numbers, I'm hitting my head against a brick wall. You don't want to do that to your clients. What may be comfortable for you is not comfortable for them. The idea is for you to be uncomfortable, not them. Because if they're uncomfortable, they're not going to hire you. By the way, that's my script. You're going to hear that one a lot. So what are the three things you need in your value proposition? <clears throat> First one, you need to set expectations. I'll show you how to do that um, briefly. And I do it through my buyer consult. So there, I have a two-step process. The first one is I call the client and I qualify them. Um, there's a form I can share with you or have Tanya send it out. It's based on the LP Mama. I've highly updated it. I call it the BIF or buyer intake form. Again, not very creative. But I use that to find what motivates them when I qualify them. Qualifying isn't just, can you afford this home? It's what are your motivations? What are your hidden motivations? Why are you buying a home? Um, I've got a client right now. She's buying a home. Dad's being very generous and doing a 1031 exchange. Well, the hidden motivation is he's got to do this flip. He's got to sell this home. He's got to buy something. So there's a timeline and it's ticking. They're both engineers, which means they'll usually take as much time as they can. But you set an engineer deadline? Oh, my God. I mean, look at Apollo 13. So that's the type of thing that you need to do. <laughs> the last piece of that stool is for your clients to really understand the process. And I go through that ad nauseum. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. We just don't have time to do the whole thing. So... Does this make sense for you guys? Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay. How many of you realize I just set your expectations? Yeah, I see some smiles and a head nod. So the whole point here is just that. This is going to be a interactive class, ideally. So feel free to unmute your mics if you're in a quiet area. And it's also going to be, you know, how you do this, actual practical. So the more you guys put in, the more you guys want to know, the more I'll concentrate on those areas. So I'm going to talk about me for a couple of seconds because Tanya brought it up. I spent 18 years as a mechanical engineer. I was in R&D. My first job out of school was at Bell Labs, where they paid me to go get my master's while working full time. Um, I also got 35 patents while I worked for them. I did literal rocket science, and you'll see why I brought that up in a second. So how many people think that's an amazing intro to selling real estate? Oh, <laughs> I see a thumbs up. Okay. And a hand. Cool. All right. So fast forward 18 years. Uh, the company I was working at was missing payroll. It was an hour and a half from home, and my wife had more leads than she can handle. So she's like, you're sort of in sales. You're doing project management. Come work for me. I'm like, um, all right. These are really softballs. I really don't know what I'm doing with sales, but sure, why not? So up to that point, I fizzboed one home um, and house hacked another. Anyone think that's a great intro into real estate? Yeah. So the point here is if I learn this, you guys can learn all of this too. It's a learned skill. <clears throat> so no, not a talent, not a gift. And if I could learn it, you guys can all learn it because I really am not that smart. It takes a while for things to get through this thick head of mine. So where am I going with all this? Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, during my three-hour class, I usually spend about 15 minutes alone unpacking this piece. The biggest takeaway here is the rules, whatever is out there and we're told we're going to be doing, are likely going to change. Because what they've implemented and what they want us to do right now are two very different things. So they want open communication and they want 
DOJ especially wants the commission to be able to be negotiated between the buyer and the seller. The seller and the listing agent, they negotiate their commission. The buyer and the buyer agent now are going to negotiate their commission. I'll show you how I do that. But when there's a disconnect between the two, that's where things get interesting. So that's where the DOJ wants the buyer and the seller to negotiate between themselves. We're going to be involved. We have to have good negotiation skills. If you guys are good agents, you already have those skills. The only difference, the biggest difference is treating your buyer like a listing. That's it. So if you have a buyer consult, if you show your value proposition, you're not going to have a problem with this change. It comes down to what's your value proposition and how do you want to be compensated and how do you get that value proposition across? Because I see us breaking down into two groups, just like we already have. It's going to be Pareto's principle, 80-20, probably closer to 95-5, but you get the idea. So the top 5%, they're probably going to have an increase in commissions. They're going to charge more because they can get more. I mean, if you're sick, you're going to go find the best doctor to help you get cured. If you need, I'll use Tanya here, if you need open heart surgery, you're not going to do it on yourself to try to save on those high hospital bills. That's in essence what a, a buyer going it alone is going to be doing. It's going to be harder than it was before. I mean, if you look at the trends over the years, we're currently trending downward on the number of people that buy FISBOs without representation or buy homes without representation. We're at an all-time low. I don't see that changing for the same very reason people don't know what they're doing. And if they do go it alone, and here's a value proposition you might want to write down and use as part of your script thing. If you decide to go it alone, did you know that you're three times more likely to end in litigation than if you hired a professional? Heavy lifts are also nice. Can you repeat that, Jason? Sure. Did you know, and you'll notice that this is in the form of a question, because that's how you control the conversations versus telling them. Did you know that if you decide to go it alone, you are more than three times more likely to end in litigation when buying a home? I love that. Now, I didn't make up that stat. That stat was given to me by an attorney who handles that, who knows those stats and shared them. <laughs> so, so maybe I'm, you could even say, are you aware that statistics show? That... There's lots of ways to say it. Yeah. So how many people know what rapport is? I've been hinting around this for a little bit. Okay. So rapport is when you get into that lovely conversation with people and it feels right. It just sort of flows. <clears throat> so we'll get into why rapport is so important right now um, and how you get into it. But real fast, how many of you have ever gone out, shown a home and written up an offer, even during COVID insanity? One time, take a buyer out, write it up. Okay, one person. All right, I've done it 35 in my last 37 times, and that's because of rapport. It's also because of the process. And this was going back before COVID. This was going back a bunch of years. So where I go through this is, <clears throat> how many of you take out a buyer once and get them under contract, typically? Or one to three times? How many times do you guys take out buyers before you get them under contract, typically? Three or four. Three or four? That's definitely decent. Yeah, many more over here. Okay. Well, we can cut that down a little bit because the side effect is if you do this and do it right, you'll get into rapport and you won't take people out tons of times. My first buyer I took out, I showed them 127 homes over nine months. The entire inventory changed over twice. Key point, something needed to change because I need less than minimum wage. I was better off flipping burgers at McDonald's. Now, they did buy a $1.65 million home. It was a $40,000 GCI. But the number of hours I put in on that, it was cheaper than a Harvard education, but not by much. <clears throat> so the point here is, how many times, how many appointments do you make before a buyer um, buys a home? How many times do you take them out or how many showings do you do per appointment? 
you're trying to drill down to what your hourly rate is because that does several things. The first one is if you figure out, and I'm going to use rough numbers, you're doing $100 an hour. Can you, if you don't like doing laundry, can you send out your laundry and cost you less than $100 an hour? Can you have someone do your lawn for less than $100 an hour? Me, I'm closer to um, $475 an hour. I'm close to the top end attorneys. So the point here is know what you do, know what you like to do, and get the rest off your plate. This way you can concentrate on what you're doing and how you do it well. So I know in New Jersey that you have to get a buyer agency agreement signed before you start working with the client. You do need to do that in Colorado too. This was before any of the law changes. How many people actually do it? See one. I have mine ready. <laughs> you have yours ready. Okay. I started this in New Jersey in um, Short Hills area, if you know where that is. Okay. Um, very well, nice area. It's super beautiful. Very, very expensive. Nice area. Very expensive. It's on the Midtown Direct train line into Wall Street. So a lot of Wall Streeters, a lot of type A personalities. Um, you could put another word behind that A letter if you want, but you get the idea. <clears throat> I got these people to sign because I didn't know any better because I was told you have to get it signed. This isn't an area where people never got these things signed. The point is the clients don't know and the rules are always changing. So if you tell them, and you cannot do this in Colorado, by the way, hey, by the way, just so you know, the laws have changed. I don't know if you've been following what's been going on with this lawsuit. Most people that are even investors aren't following what's going on and they don't know. Just so you know, by law, you have to sign this before I can show you a home. Now, the negotiation part on that comes back down to, um, is it a single showing? Is it for a day? Is it for a week? Is it for a year? You know, Do you let the clients out if you don't like working with them or do you keep them locked up? I personally tell my clients, if something isn't working, be happy to let you go with three days written notice. Hopefully we'll have a conversation before we ever get to that point. There are a lot of restrictions by law on what I can and cannot do. So if I'm not doing something you want, please talk to me. I might not be able to do it by law. So that's the type of transparency that these people are looking for. Now I said you can't do this in Colorado because it is against state law. In Colorado, you are allowed to do showings without having a buyer agency agreement signed. By law, told to us by the Department of Real Estate head counsel. And she says, if anyone says that, they will be fined. Surprise. So <clears throat> for me, a big part of that 35 out of 37, getting them to buy the first home that I take them out to see or take them out once you know, that's a 94.6% success rate. A big part of that is getting them to sign the buyer agency agreement because that's the contract that they use to hire me. And those are keywords. It is a contract and that is how they hire me. Write down that script if you haven't already. <clears throat> all right, so going back to this, I know you're all here, you want the secret sauce. This is a small group. So. Take out a pen and write this down. I've said this before. You need to have your clients and prospects know what your value proposition is. That's the big key. That's why they will hire you. Because if they know, like, and trust you, which is rapport, and they know your value proposition, 99 out of 100 will actually hire you. Whether or not they do anything is another story, but they will hire you. So let's unpack the value proposition. In order to have your clients and prospects understand your value proposition, you need to know what it is yourself. So how do you do that? Well, go make a 30 second elevator pitch if you need to do. Write it down, memorize it like your favorite script. For me, I have several different things and it depends on the type of client that I deal with. How many people know what the disk profile is? I see a couple of hands, a few head nods. So the what is it? The DISC profile is a way to quickly guess at what your clients 
behavior patterns are and how to adapt to them. Um, we're in EXP. Um, I do have a link, I'll share it with Tanya to send it out. And that specifically goes in and drops you into a class with Michael Abelson. And he goes in depth for over an hour on what the disc is. For me, I ask simple questions. And we'll get into this more on how to figure that out and what that looks like. Can I add something? Sure. Um, EXP now, every one of you that's with EXP can go to your dashboard and the disc is free to everybody. So take 15 minutes because it's going to give you a whole report on how to communicate with different personality styles and how to identify them. Absolutely. If you know how to deal with yourself and what your typical position is, and you can guess what your client is, like the um, type A person personality Wall Streeter, um, typically those are very high Ds and Cs. DC is a nickname acronym, don't care. I'll get into this more in a second, but you'll just get the idea. So getting back to the value proposition, the first one is setting expectations. If your clients, 90% of your clients don't know how you work. Me personally, I tell them, hey, I work from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. six days a week. I take one day a week off and it floats. Are you okay with that? I'll always get back to you within 24 hours. You'll see this in my buyer presentation. I'll actually share it with you. But those are my actual scripts. Those are actually not written down in the value in my proposition. But you get the point. They just sort of come out. These are internalized. So if you have scripts, get a role play partner, practice them. Because, well, <clears throat> Short Hills is an expensive area. Boulder is even more expensive. Um, the average list price right now in our MLS is two point something. Uh, I think it was 2.15 when I looked at it Monday. Uh, those are expensive homes. That's a big commission. You know, I don't care if you're at 2%, 2.5, 2.8, 3, 3, 2, whatever you're at. That's a lot of money. That's five figures. So don't mess it up because that's MBA Harvard expensive. <clears throat> The other is qualified. We talked about this briefly, finding their motivating factors. You know the phrase, buyers are liars? They do that because they don't know what they're looking for. My wife and I are the worst buyers. She's been a professional for over 35 years. So if we can't articulate and find what we like, how are people who are not professionals who are first-time buyers going to do this? So... Go figure them out. Go figure it out. Tell them it may take a while. It's okay. It process may be iterative. You know, does that help with your one and done? Well, it does if they're doing all their searching online. You know, it having Zoom calls showing people what things are looking like or telling them to go to open houses really cuts down on taking them out. <clears throat> um so the next piece of this that's super critical is neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP. By the I've way, we still see your slide that says who wants the secret sauce. I'm not sure if you're... Yeah, that's right. Okay. Because this is part two of the secret sauce. Okay. So that's, you know, NLP. What is that? Neuro-linguistic programming. Um, I've taken several courses. Basically, it comes down to... What are the clients hearing and what are they understanding? Because what you say is sometimes just as important as how you say it. So you've noticed a lot of times my questions aren't ending like a typical question. They're downward swings. There's more like a statement. There's a whole reason why I can talk for and usually do for over a half hour just on that piece. But the point is, go take some NLP classes. There's some recordings in the EXP library. There's some great stuff on YouTube. The last piece is having the right skills and mindset. Because when you have that and the NLP piece, you'll be able to communicate your value proposition to your client. When you do that, they will sign. I think I have never... I've, only had one person who wasn't a real client refuse to sign the buyer agency agreement. Now, if they refuse to sign it and they're not going to tell you why, are they even a real client or are they just there to waste your time, which is what this guy was. 
So I'm going to skip through a lot of this because it's redundant. I've already hit most of it. But the main point here is I've studied rocket science. Real estate is not rocket science. It's a lot of hard work, but it's not particularly difficult. So meaning rocket science, you have to be super smart and really creative and really dig at something. Real estate is doing relatively simple tasks that are hard to do. Most agents consider this thing to be about 800 pounds. So if you can't pick up the phone and cold call to get your clients, what are you going to do instead? That's kind of the point. <clears throat> so here's another little script that you guys can drop. Um, did you know that FISBOs, while they typically sell for 9% less, have three times more litigation because the participants only sell a few homes in their lifetime versus hiring an active professional who sells that in a month or even a week? Come again? <laughs> did you know that FISBOs? Sell for 9% less on average but have three times the litigation because they only sell a few homes in their lifetime. You know, here's some value props for you, just to give you an idea. How many people do continuing ed? I mean, we have to, three year cycle. I think that might be a value prop. How many people have taken a contracts class in the last week or two or are going to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, did you guys know the contracts just changed? You know, say that to your clients. You know, my favorite question to start that conversation is, when was the last time did you buy or sell a home? Was it in your state? For me, that's Colorado. Great. Hey, by the way, did you know the contracts have changed since then and so did the process? No? Okay, let me walk you through it so you don't make some of the common mistakes and get caught out. Does that sound good to you? Notice, again, downward swing, sound good to you. It's a statement. It takes practice to do that. Typically, I stand up here, stick my arm out in front of me and bring it down as I'm saying the statement. It took me about a week of practice to get it right. Not an easy thing for me to figure out the first time. Doing that while saying a question will be able to help you direct the conversation, yet make the other person feel like they're in control of the conversation because they're speaking more, right? By the way, right's a tie down. Notice again, that question was with a downward swing. It was a statement. So if you say something like, <clears throat> I jumped, with that downward swing, it's a statement. It's an indisputable fact it already happened. Great. If you say, I jumped, upward swing. Question, did you jump? Why did you jump? What caused you to jump? How high did you jump? You know, you, you've already, your mind's going down that rabbit hole and you've already missed what I said in the last three things. So that's kind of the point of the downward swing. <laughs> so continuing on here, a bunch of bullet points on this slide. I'm going to skip over some of them. We already hit on role play and scripts. Anyone want to know why this is so critical? Just spit it out. I mean, I think it's it's critical because buyers and sellers are looking for competency. Mm -hmm. They're looking for confidence. They and are. confidence comes with the competency and knowing like what to say. Yep. Buyers and sellers all have gone to buyer and seller school. They have a set number of objections that they all throw at you. Um, I had a friend, he was selling this condo here in Boulder and he was like the worst buyer. You know, he gave me two objections. I went, okay. He was like, what do you mean? Okay, I go, come on, give me the rest of the objections. You went to seller school, give me the other five. He goes, what do you mean? I go, these are the standard things that everyone says. Now I said this to him because he was a friend and I was joking around, but he also didn't want to sit through the listing presentation to see what we're going to do for him. He's like, just list it and get it sold. He's like, you don't know the process here, do you? Oh, I sold a home here. I go, okay, how long ago? Well, five years ago. Oh, it was actually closer to seven, but okay. Do you know what's changed since then? Well, nothing. It's just selling home. 
actually a lot of things have changed, <clears throat> including what the um, environment is that we're in, which is shifting quickly. So let me ask you, what's the most important thing for you? He goes, okay, what's that? You know, no, you tell me what's the most important thing for you. He goes, oh, I want to get the most amount of money. I go, what else? Why are you selling the home? It's an investment. He goes, oh, it's a pain in the ass. I don't want to deal with it anymore. At which point he turns around and it gives me the objection. I'll just hold it and rent it again. I go, you just told me it's a pain in the ass and you don't want to deal with this and you can make more money doing something else with the money. So why are you holding out? He goes, oh, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> Now, we ended up not working with him because I valued my friendship more. But the whole point is there's a set number of objections. And if you know what those objections are, you can have scripts to handle them. Objection handlers, learn what they are. And if you're particularly good with this process, you won't need them anymore because you won't get objections because you've handled all the objections up front by setting expectations. By the way, in a class that we had yesterday, um, I got a sample of a ton of scripts. I don't know if you're giving these away, Jason, and then do's and don'ts, what to say, what not to say. And it's, it's I'm going to send this out to you guys as well. And definitely send it out. Um, most of my scripts are written down in my book. I don't have a script book anymore, so I can't just give you a document. Here are all my scripts. They just sort of come out when prompted. Um, but the whole point is when I started role play, I was really really bad at it then it got internalized and I'm not bad at it anymore mm -hmm. so you know I mentioned the average price in Boulder and you know we're talking MBA Harvard if you just wing it so I typically will practice it so I don't have to wing it all right so I was talking about the disc before <laughs> as well as the um, buyer intake sheet so I'll send you guys the, uh, I'll actually send the BIF to Tanya who'll send it out to you. But the whole point of this is I call and have a conversation. I've coached some people on my team on doing this. They don't have an I, which I'll get into in a second. So they don't like to call people. They send it out as a questionnaire to great effect. But, <clears throat> you know, the whole point of this and the disc, which I'll get into right now, Eyes are people who like to talk a lot. If someone doesn't take a breath where you can get a word in edgewise, that's a high eye and likely nothing else. It's very rare to be nothing else on the disc. Most people are combinations. Most engineers are very high SCs. Ss are very steady. Nothing rocks their boat. Cs are extremely detail oriented. You put an SC together and these people are scaredy cats. They need data to make a decision. This is your typical engineer, your accountant. So give them that data. Also give them deadlines to make the decision. You know, we're, the rates just dropped. I'm seeing buyers coming out of the woodwork. Listings just popped like mad. You know, has anything happened? Well, there's been a lot of showings, which means, well, today's Wednesday. So by Thursday, there's probably gonna be a lot of under contracts that I'm seeing coming through on MLS. Or if there's not, that's something else I can be telling people, hey, there's a lot of showings, but no one's pulling the trigger yet. So we still have a chance. Or do you wanna wait until we get into that multiple bid situation? So there's a lot of scripts, knowing what options they have for purchasing helps a lot here. So these, that's your Wall Streeter type. They're very direct, um, very to the point. The left side of this chart, the task-oriented chart, they like spreadsheets, they like bullet points, they like checklists. One of the things I do, Colorado has a whole list of dates on page two and three of the contract. I copy and paste that literally into a Google Sheet and share it with my clients. And basically it's the dates that things are due and when they've been completed and what's coming up. It satisfies those D's and C's amazingly. It keeps me on point as well. Sometimes I'll send emails to remind them when there's a bunch of things coming up. Otherwise they just go in and check when they want it out. The I's and S's, those are people oriented. Um, <clears throat> this is much more the touchy feely. I want to have a good neighborhood. That's how these people show up. The D's and I's 
are warmer colors. They're more active personalities, more outgoing. Most salespeople or many successful salespeople are DIs. Doesn't mean if you're in sales and you're not a DI that you're gonna be a failure. It just is a generality. Um, <clears throat> these can be direct, they can be risk takers, they can be decisive. This is what we're doing, let's move on. Why are we still discussing it? The SCs are a cooler personality, more passive. You know, you'll hear an engineer say something like, oh, I'm really excited. Meanwhile, they're jumping up and down inside. So know that when you're talking with these people, that's why the disc is really important. So your DC and gave them the nickname or someone gave them the nickname, don't care because they'll run right over your emotions and not even realize they're doing it. I actually had someone's wife tell me that he's going to do this. Don't take it personally. It's just who he is. He was a Wall Streeter. So one of the things I do on this buyer intake form is I ask, what do you do for a living? Because I'll get a really good sense of what you do from what you do on where you fall in the disc. And if I know what your disc profile is, I know how to present information to you where you will hear it, see it, and understand it. Does this make sense? This is a cheap way to get into what their learning profile is. Now, what do you do if um, you're showing a spouse and their significant other a property and they're two opposites, which is typically how it happens on the desk. You look at them straight in the eye and go, okay, I'm talking your language. Here's all the details you want. I'm ignoring you over there. I know your eyes are glazing, but deal with me right here. Okay, now I'm talking to you over here. And then you talk to them in their pattern and you make eye contact with them when you switch the patterns. When role-playing, I last maybe 10 minutes being in a pattern that I am not typically good at. I typically talk fast. I'm a high DI with a trailing C, so I am a dick. And yes, I made a dick joke, so you don't need to. But that's how I survived in engineering for 18 years. This, I brought the C up and I was able to, with work, be detail-oriented. But every manager I had pegged me as something other than an engineer that would be going higher in management. And the reason why is because I didn't act, talk, or walk like a typical engineer. But I did it for 18 years and I was very successful at it. So the point is, you know, you say an engineer, great, SC, not really, I have no S. My wife has only D, that's less than 9% of the population. Most common in the US are ICs followed by ISs. You're gonna run into a lot of those people. <clears throat> Cs can be stubborn. Eyes have the attention span of a goldfish. Oh, look, there's a bird. You get the idea. Um, Ss, literally nothing rocks their boat, but they also look like they have the emotional capacity of a dust bunny. So, I mean, sometimes with S's, you feel like you're talking to a wall. Um, you, you get the idea of how these people, the pros and cons of their behaviors. So this is super, super important knowing this. And are you saying, Jason, just because I know we have 15 more minutes. Yep. Um, knowing these personality styles is how you're going to present your questions, Yep. Your statistics. <clears throat> if someone's a high S, I don't get very excited. I try to slow things down. I'm a bit mellower. I try to feel my heart rate coming down. Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. I've got your back. So that's the type of thing that I do. NLP also teaches you to do the pregnant pause, which is very uncomfortable, especially for a high DI. We want things to keep on moving, move it, come on. We, we need to be efficient here. That's a high D. <clears throat> Even a C wants to be efficient. So what's the point? If I have someone who's an off the charts D, I've got five minutes or less to get through this entire questionnaire. If I have an I, high IS, I'm gonna be on the phone for an hour and I'm gonna get through the first two questions but I'll fill out most of the sheet because they'll tell it to me as I'm getting there. I see some people laughing because you run into these people. <coughs> now, 
<clears throat> my wife thought I was not being efficient with my time because she's a high D. But on the contrary, by spending time here, I had an amazing conversion process. I got people to sign the buyer agency agreement without hesitation almost all the time. The SCs were the typical people who were hesitant because they didn't see the data. They didn't have the data. They couldn't process it fast enough to make sure that, yeah, you actually know your collective stuff. So in Colorado, I am still allowed, unlike what Nara is saying, to take people out. And I tell them, I will take you out once before you have to uh, sign the buyer agency agreement to hire me. Now, in other states, you can't say that. What you can say is, by law, I have to have this signed before I can show you a home. Now, if it doesn't work out, I will release you from this contract. It's a perfect workaround. The C's, they are rule followers. So you have to do this. Okay, I'll do this. <laughs> It'll overcome the ass. You see how this is starting to come together? All right, cool. I have a question for Shoot. you. Shoot. Um, so, you know, we, we have them sign the buyer's, the buyer's uh, broker agreement, right? Mm -hmm. But um, there's a con there's co contradiction on the precedence, right? So if they're working with another agent and you say, you know, hey, are you working with another agent? Have they showed you any homes? What is your advice there? Because it's the procur procuring cause, right? So, there is no more procuring cause. It's gone. It's dead. Okay. So that's dead. But what if they sign something? Like what kind of questions should these agents be asking? Because if they sign something that's a one party showing, multiple party showings with the MLS, mm -hmm. like how do agents protect themselves from that? Because I feel that the it's the latest. Line? Can you see the line um, above financing, working with another agent? That's one of the A's in LP Mama. That's one of the questions. So I asked them, are you working with another agent? Well, sort of, what did you sign with them? Because yeah. it's no longer, did you sign? It's what did you sign? Is it a one day showing? Is it a one home showing? And my script for that is because I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I want to be respectful of the agreement that you have signed. <clears throat> that's how I do that. So that's one of the questions. Um, so going through this, I ask them what they do for their living. Um, who's buying the house? Is it you and somebody else? It's first time buyers who are single. A lot of times parents or friends are involved. Great. Let's get them involved in the process because the last thing you want to do is have their expectations not set on what you can afford and what you can get for your money here. And they think that you can get a home that's three times the cost. And they'll be disappointed with what you're buying, even though it's the best that you can afford. Does that make sense? <laughs> so a big part of the questions here is it helps get you in rapport. So by doing this ahead of time, and the next step after this is setting the buyer consult appointment, trying to do that within a week, you'll still be in that rapport. They'll still feel good about it, even if they're buying in a year. Because a lot of times they'll say that they're buying in a year and they'll end up buying in six months. Mm -hmm. They're buying in six months, they'll buy in three. Occasionally things will go backwards, but usually not. <clears throat> Jason, can uh, or Tanya, can you go over the procuring cause? Is it clause cause? There, there is no more procuring cause. The settlement effectively killed it. So procuring what is cause, it actually? Oh, thank you. Procuring mm -hmm. cause used to be whoever had an agreement and showed the person the home first. So let's say you're my buyer. <clears throat> I showed you a home on 123 Main Street, but you went to the listing agent and bought it directly. List, I call the listing agent. I go, hey, listen, I see you went under contract. My client said they're buying it directly from you. I have a signed buyer agency agreement. I showed the home on the 11th to them. You have it in your showing list. You know, I have procuring cause, meaning you're going to have to pay me do you want to work together on this or are you just going to pay me at the end of it? I'm not going to pay you at all. Okay, great. 
just so you know, I'm going to have my broker file a claim against you because I have procuring cause. And then it goes to, um, not litigation, but um, I'm blanking on the word. Basically a hearing and thank you. And determines, yeah, you get money and it comes out of the other agent's side. Now there is no procuring cause anymore because you have to have a signed buyer's agent agreement with the person ahead of time. So if your client decides to go and do that, they buy a home, you go after your client, not the other agent. Well, also if they show a property, right? If your client is shown a property by another agent that actually put that particular MLS number and now you're writing the offer up on it, right? You could get caught in a pickle there too. That's why you have to ask these questions, right? Are they, have they signed with another, have they seen the house with another agent? Have they signed a document with another agent to see a home? That's what I'm saying. That's, that's the big thing. If they sign is there, is, a home and go ahead. that particular MLS, if it's that particular home, that's why we have to ask a lot of questions. That's the power of this form. Yep. Is to keep you out of trouble with that. So if they have seen a home, 123 Main Street with Bradley Byers agent, great. You know, if you buy that home, if you want to buy that home because he showed it to you, you're going to have to use him. Oh, he was an awful agent. Okay. Well, then we probably aren't going to be able to buy that home, just so you know, because you signed an agreement with them. And is there now, where it's unclear is how long does he have the right to claim the commission if it's a week, a month, a year later, you show the same home to that client and then write it up. And where it's going to get really murky is, you know, oh, I went into an open house and signed an agreement and it's a three-year agreement for all homes. That's going to happen. One-year agreement, whatever it is. All these people are going to sign up with these agents not knowing that they're signing up for them to be their exclusive buyer's agent. Now, but is I'm, it not true that, um, and again, like we just talked about, it's all fluid. You talked to the attorneys, but what I heard was it's as long as it's not a specific MLS number, it's the new, the latest agreement takes precedence. Like you don't have for the to most part, but that hasn't been, that's going to be on state level and that's going to play out in the courts. So I personally don't want to have my paycheck wrapped up in something that's going to play out in the courts. So the whole point here is to be upfront and transparent and not go down that road. <clears throat> Make sense? Well, yeah, and yesterday they were talking about even in text, like this lady had the buyer and the seller. So she was she was uh, representing the seller. They also want to buy something, but they had already had another agent. But they're like, I want to work with you. Like, I love the way you work. She's And she was a broker. She said, be really careful about how you text that back and forth. You know, I just, you know, I'd love to help you. You could do, you could work with them either way. I'd love to earn your business, but I just want to let you know, I'm here to help you. Not like, yeah, you can work with me and you can cancel that agreement. You got to be really careful what you put in writing, like on text and stuff. Yeah. Because you don't want to say, I can only work with you if you cancel that agreement. What you say is, I cannot work with you if you've already signed an agreement with somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle. But the difference is you're not telling them what to do. Now, if they call you and say, hey, how do I get out of this other working with this other person? I'm just gonna the say conversation's that. different. But I would never do it where it's recorded or written down. Yep. <clears throat> you know, my first line would be, I would talk to a real estate attorney. Oh, come on. People do this all the time. Yes, they do. You know. Tell the agent you don't want to work with them and you want to cancel the agreement. You know, I have a feeling no, going you know, to... that's when you talk to your attorney. But in all likelihood, it comes back down to who is doing what for the client and who's being transparent and working well. Because I know there's ambulance chaser attorneys out there waiting for us to misstep and looking to make a buck. That's what this is coming down to. I would. I'm not going to be putting my commission co-op 
from a listing on a website anywhere, even though the NAR agreement says you cannot do it, but you can do it, but you can't do it. So I'm just not going there. Now, will they get sued? I have no idea, but I've been through lawsuits. They're not fun. I really don't want to do it again. So we're running out of time. <clears throat> Some of the key things I want to get in here is um, this thing that's circled. Because when you have spouses, they may have different ideas on what they want in the home. You know, open kitchen, big six burner stove, four car garage, whatever it is. You know, one of the tricks here is I ask the clients, all right, go home when the kids are in bed. Um, open a bottle of wine. Each of you write your list of three most important things you want to have and then everything else. Then I want you to combine your lists. And three is very important because it's only going to be two and one or three and zero. I ask the next day, who had the most, who had what answers on the three most important things? Whoever had the most answers will be the person who's making the decision. It may not be the dominant person in the relationship. So in the case of the stockbroker that I brought out for the showing, he was buying his home, his wife a home that he would sleep in. He wanted her to be happy. He gave her literally everything that was on the checklist. His only checklist was, I want to be in this town so I can catch the train. And by the way, the schools are amazing. So <clears throat> that was also on her list. So it might not be apparent who the decision maker is. That's what you want to figure out with those three important questions. It also comes down where it's like, well, I want a wood burning fireplace. Um, great. Those are outlawed and the only ones that are left in Colorado are grandfathered for the most part. So that means we're going to be looking at older homes. I want hardwood floors. Great. We can rip up carpets and install them after the fact, right? Well, yeah, I never thought about that. So getting those three most important things down, you know, a fenced yard for a dog. Okay, so if the yard isn't fenced, would you be willing to put up a fence for the dog if it's the perfect house otherwise? Yeah. Do you see how questions can now take down objections and open up limits? You're not saying you can't get it. It's just here it is. One of the things I will say when people are coming from out of state, oh, I want a pool. Why is that important to you? We don't have pools here. Our lots are too small. And generally speaking, people don't deal with it. They like the social aspects of having a pool club instead. Is that okay for you? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to need to refer you. There's a couple of pools uh, about an hour and a half outside of town where you want to be. Is that okay? Oh, no, I have to be in town. Okay. So what do you want to do? I'm not telling them you can't get the pool. I'm just telling you you can't get the pool in the place you want it. What's more important? So that's what this form lets you do. Does that make sense? Okay. So in my last couple of seconds here, <clears throat> the way you dig deep on this is by a simple question or variation of, tell me more about that, or what will that do for you? Or why is that important for you? So if someone says they want a three bedroom home, and they're single, great. Out of curiosity, with curiosity is the softener, why is that important to you? <clears throat> or what will that do for you? What are you gonna do with that third bedroom? Are you planning on getting roommates? Do you have a girlfriend where you're planning on getting married and having family? Is it an office? Do you have a lot of guests? So will an office versus an actual bedroom work instead? By the way, do you know what a legal definition of a bedroom is? Egress door, um, egress window, door, closet, and not a um, transient room to get to a captured room behind it. You know, most clients don't understand that. Many agents don't, from what I've seen in the MLS, for that matter. But do you see how you can dig deep to find those motivations? Okay. So we are at the top of the hour again. Um, I have written a book. It's If I go through the entire book, it's obviously going to be like an eight hour plus class, probably longer. Um, it's pretty cheap. It's on Amazon. I'll shoot Tanya the link. If you guys are interested in scripts, 
Uh, you can download the Kindle if you have Kindle credits for free or get the paperback if you'd like to make notes in it. Um, this obviously I got through just the amount to get skills. Um, Tanya, what are you asking? Oh, never mind. Sorry. <clears throat> um, so what I did was give you an overview of the basic skills that you needed. I didn't really get into the how you put it together because we went deeper on the skills section, which I think is more important because if you get these skills together, it naturally flows into how you present them. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you guys want, you can ask Tanya for me to do the second part of this or, you know, just get the book and it'll show you the examples and how to actually apply it. So you're applying this to, like you're showing how to uh, have, the, have the conversation, the scripts, you're showing how to put the contract together. What is it? Yeah. Uh, so going through, I actually step through. It. When I do this with my clients, it can, the high Ds usually will be done in 30 minutes, maybe a little bit uh, less. Uh, most everyone else, it's an hour. If I've got someone with a high C, um, it's an hour and a half going through this package. So the super short version is, I'll share this with you guys as well. Um, Trish and I have basically made up only one slide in this entire presentation. This is her listing presentation that I've hijacked and converted into a buyer presentation. So if you guys have a buyer presentation, uh, sorry, a listing presentation you like, use it. It converts pretty easily. So this slide is one of the things that I spend time on. This is where the scripts that I gave you earlier come from. Um, <clears throat> this slide here is how I set expectations. I spent a lot of time on this slide. I literally stepped through step-by-step step what each piece is, what it means. Um, when I was in Jersey, I would tell my clients if they were from New York, everything you know about real estate is going to be backwards. All your friends that bought in New York are going to tell you, you cannot buy, uh, you should not sign anything because you've just bought the home. Just so you know, in New Jersey, the only way to negotiate is to sign a contract. Yeah, and then I'm not going to get into the new whole New Jersey piece of uh, being an attorney state, but <laughs> you get the idea. So knowing where your clients are coming from is critical. Giving them the overview on what the process is going to be look like will eliminate a lot of objections up front because of setting those expectations. Does this make sense? Yep, it does. Right. Thank you so much. And then we'll you're, talk about you can you're welcome. second class. I think the biggest thing is, is um, my takeaway for these agents, and I hope you guys see this, is you have to have a value prop, right? The value prop is part of it is your confidence and competence in going to these things. Make sure you have a process, right? A buyer presentation, a seller presentation. Um, we are going to be putting together some real estate resumes for y'all. So then you can just go into Canva and like add that kind of thing. Um, but you just have to show them why you're worth the success fee. Jason, um, thank you. This was wonderful. You guys go out and buy his book. All right. Thank Thanks you. so much.